Hello and welcome to Wednesday Warfare, where I review NXT and AEW Dynamite back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. Little heads up, in case you missed it over on Ring of Honor's YouTube channel on Wednesday, I was the moderator for the Taven Vincent Summit that took place in the afternoon, uh, trying to bring some closure and resolution to this long-standing feud between Matt Taven and Vincent of the Righteous. Although I have to say, I kind of walked away from it with more questions than answers, but go check that out if you'd like. And for now, like what you like, don't be a dick. NXT opens up with GM Willie Riggs making his two big announcements. The first one being that TakeOver, Stand and Deliver uh, going on Mania Week is going to be two nights, Wednesday on USA, Thursday on Peacock, because you know, in WWE, more is more. His next announcement is, well, more of that actually, because he brings up the whole women's division on the ramp, and he talks about what happened with the big tag team championship controversy last week when Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler came to town. So Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez are brought into the ring, and Regal says, by virtue of them having been the women's Dusty Classic winners, they are now the first ever NXT women's tag team champions. So he presents the belts and gives them the gives them to them. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But Dakota and Raquel talk some trash about how they dominated the women's division to get to where they are and how it's just the beginning for them. But Shotzi Blackheart and Ember Moon, who uh, Dakota and Raquel beat in the finals of the Dusty Classic, step up and basically challenge them to a match for the titles tonight. And William Regal makes the match so. So once again, more is more. I'm kind of of two minds about this. Because on the one hand, I do think the NXT women's division is robust enough at this point point that you could feasibly make like tag belts on a tag division focused around those belts. And I get that. But at the same time, it's like there's already so many championships in WWE and that whole umbrella right now. And they already have a hard enough time booking one set of women's tag team champions across like two or three brands as it was. And now they're going to try and do it again with another tag team championship for the ladies. I just think it's a bit too much. And honestly, kind of takes away one of the things that was special special and cool about the main roster women's tag belts because they were floating belts. And yeah, NXT got the short end of the stick more often than not, like they were on Raw and SmackDown far more, but the possibility of them being on NXT is what I think made it kind of special. And so I guess giving the NXT brand their own women's belts, like that kind of frees up, you know, the women's tag champs to be on Raw and SmackDown enough. But I think having it on NXT was what made it pretty cool. And them taking that away, I thought was kind of unnecessary. Uh, but yeah, again, I think it's, you know, more is more championships upon championships. I think it's kind of a glut in that company right now, but if any division right now can pull that off, it's NXT. And speaking of the ladies, the first match of the evening is for the NXT Women's title as Io Shirai takes on her long-standing rival, Tony Storm. And this is a great match here. These two have a great rapport as they work together in the ring. Uh, at one point, uh, Io goes for a moonsault. Tony moves out of the way, hits the Storm Zero, but there's a kick out. Tony goes for a flying headbutt, but she misses, and Io gets her in the cross face, and Tony taps. It was a great matchup with a really exciting finish, and man, like how good has Io Shirai's reign as champion been since winning it last year. She's beaten everybody. Like, who is left? We see Finn Balor backstage having a sit. The champion talks about Adam Cole and how he's been doing a lot of talking, but now there's nobody to back him up this time and how Finn beat Cole to become the champion and he will beat him again to retain it. Elsewhere, uh, LA Knight is being interviewed and he declares that his first match in NXT is going to be next week. And then as he's doing that, Bronson Reed just rushes him and throttles him and it's pulled apart. So, you know, we understand as we gathered last week, that Bronson Reed is going to be his first opponent for Mr. Los Angeles Knight. Jake Atlas takes on Pete Dunn up next. It's mostly Dunn's match. I mean, Jake's got a couple of moments uh, in his comeback, but Dunn takes him out with a joint manipulation and makes him tap out to a very sick-looking armbar. And afterward, Dunn on the microphone, and he's accompanied, by the way, by Oni Lorcan and Danny Burch. He's on the mic and says you know, he's the best technical wrestler in the world today. Who's going to prove him wrong? Whom, I ask? Whom could it be? I was about to say, maybe Timothy Thatcher, but as soon as I said that to myself, we cut to see Imperium cutting a promo where Marcel, Bartel, and the gang are basically off 
offering Thatcher a spot in the Imperium because we have we, we had a great thing together back in that time in the past with names we can't quite say here on programming, but we had a history, so we had a great time. So they're inviting Thatcher to join the group and Champa as well. And Iconer even says, if you want to bring your friend and get his permission, we'll bring him along too. We'll make it work out of respect for you. So condescending, and we'll wonder where that's all going to go. And then we see Leon Ruff being interviewed as well, cutting a promo on Swerve about what happened a couple weeks ago and saying, you know, uh, he's been busting his ass to get to where he is, like, unlike what Swerve's been accusing him of doing. And says when they fight next week, uh, Swerve's going to get a rough landing. So here we have our first ever NXT Women's Tag Team Championship match as the inaugural champs were Kel and Dakota defend against Shotzi Blackheart and Ember Moon. This is a very good competitive match. I loved Shotzi's hot tag near the end. She was a house of fire. In the end, Dakota knocks Ember and Raquel off the apron, and that allows Shotzi to roll Dakota up to win. And so on the same night, the belts are awarded to the heels. You have Shotzi and Ember winning it, and so they become the second ever tag team champs to NXT. And I'm really happy for Shotzi as someone I, I worked with her a little bit in the Bay Area before she got signed. I'm very just happy to see her succeed, and Ember too, for that matter. Um, it's an interesting choice to have the belts change hands like that on the same night as they're introduced, but it keeps things spontaneous. I kind of there's a part of me that likes that. Part of me I'm like, ah, it seems like kind of too soon. Like let's give Raquel and Dakota more time with it. But I mean, they've already got their heat and their credibility from winning the Dusty Classic, and so I'm sure we'll see more between these two teams in the long run. Uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely an exciting way to get the women's tag belts talked about. Adam Cole backstage saying Takeover is going to come early this evening when he regains the championship from Finn Balor. Elsewhere, we see the new tag team champions Shotzi and Ember get a big standing ovation. Lots of congratulations from the other ladies on the roster, except for Indy Hartwell and Candice LeRae, who are kind of uh, booing them from afar. They walk down the hallway to find Johnny Gargano. They're looking for Austin Theory. Austin shows up and tries to kind of like uh, confront Johnny for paying off a therapist last week. Is it you pay off the therapist? And Johnny, with the most accurate comeback ever, well, therapy ain't free. Very good point. And so basically, Gargano tries to get more into Austin's head and kind of repeat what Dexter allegedly said about him that pisses off Austin when he says the 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 uh, mid-level uh, abdominal region or whatever he says, and Austin just tears his shirt off. He's looking for blood. We find out they're gonna have a, a match between those two guys next week. But the story between Johnny and Austin is very interesting. I think it's very clear that Johnny is like feeding him these lines and that there's no way Dexter really said that. So when that reveal is going to happen, time will tell. But things are kind of chugging along in that direction. So we'll see. Former friends turned bitter rivals, Caden Carter versus Zia Lee up next. Uh, Casey Catanzaro comes out with crutches about a minute into the match. Zia very vicious here, and ultimately Casey can stand no more. She hits Zia with one of her crutches, and the match ends in a DQ. Ultimately, Boa comes in and takes one of the crutches away from Casey and breaks it in half, threatens her until Caden hits him with the other crutch, and he and Zia Lee powder and head back to Mei Ying up on the throne there. It's nice to see Team K getting some fire here, even though Casey Casey is injured. The first real moment of weakness Zaya has had since her big heel turn and her big rehabilitation uh, with Tiang Sha and all that stuff. So wondering where how that's gonna develop and everything. Where will Boa fit into all this? When's Boa gonna actually work? Like I'm really curious about that because Boa's been there for a long time. It feels like, and I wonder if it's, it's inevitable he's gonna wrestle. I guess, but like when? Like <laughs> I almost want to see like Boa and Amos just kind of like do a kind of a game of chicken. Who's the last? one who's actually going to wrestle a match. We get a cell phone promo in an airport terminal from the official NXT Cruiserweight Champion, pre-pandemic at least, Jordan Devlin. He announces that his travel ban has been lifted and he's heading over to NXT to confront the interim champion, Santos Escobar. I wouldn't be surprised if we get a unification match at one of the TakeOver nights, so we'll have to wait and see on that one. Could be good. And then we see a Zoe Stark promo package. It's very standard babyface fare here about how she grew up loving wrestling and how now that she's with NXT, she feels at home, puts the rest of the women's roster on notice, that sort of thing. And then we see as a follow-up to the Jordan Devlin announcement, we see Santos Escobar having a bit of a tense chat with Willie Riggs about that development. And speaking of Santos, we see Joaquin Wilde and Raul Mendoza taking on the Grizzled Young Veterans up next. Only a minute in the match though, we see presumably Brizongo making their entrance with their big astronaut suits. 
but they take off the helmet and it's MSK underneath, and that distraction's enough to cost GYV the match. Afterward, MSK beat them up a bit, and uh, Wesley slamming his astronaut helmet onto Zach Gibson's hand, revenge for his hand injury a couple of weeks ago. Then the actual Brizongos show up, and they clean house. We get kind of like a moment between MSK and Brizongo in the ring, and uh, yeah, I thought this was a kind of a, a fun segment to see Brizongo come back. I always enjoy seeing uh, Tyler Breeze and, and uh, Fandango and everything, so good to see them, and it feels like we're setting something up for the takeover, some kind of maybe eight-man match. I, I could definitely see Legato del Fantasma and GYV teaming up against MSK and Brizongo, but again, you know, they're planting some seeds here, and we'll have to find out what happens. Backstage, Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez very upset about having lost the titles earlier, but they're still the, the first ever women's tag team champs in NXT. Io Shirai just up and confronts Raquel Gonzalez and says, I want to face you next. And just when I was thinking, well, who's left for Io to face? Raquel is left. And I think we can start to pinpoint a, a time frame in which Io is going to lose that title. Just saying. Backstage, Timothy Thatcher's asked about Imperium's offer to join them along with Champa, but then Tommaso Champa walks in and says, you know, that doesn't really interest me. What interests me is their general across the pond, referring to Walter. Definitely excited for the possibility of that match happening. And then we go to our main event as Finn Balor defends the NXT title against Adam Cole. This is a big, you know, dramatic, knocky draggy kind of match that you come to expect from both of these guys. It's very well done, even though I feel we've seen this stuff from them before. Finn does kick out of some major moves, including the Panama Sunrise. He throws Cole over the top rope into the outside, and as Cole's recovering, he sees Kyle O'Reilly on the other side of the barricade staring daggers at him. That allows Finn to hit the 1916 on the floor. Coup de Gras in the ring. Finn retains the championship. And then afterward, Kyle gets in the ring, confronts Cole. He blocks a low blow and very dramatically removes the UE armband that uh, Cole is still wearing. And he starts beating up Cole, chases him out of the arena, saying, you did this, you made me this way. You know, we've heard that line before. But basically, yeah, he's, he's beating up Cole, chasing him to the back. I felt that him coming back this soon felt a bit soon, honestly. That's something I think you could milk a lot longer if we're setting up a match for TakeOver. You could have, uh, a couple more weeks I think you could have done, uh, at least one more week I think, where Kyle's in the back burner and then he shows up as big dramatic beatdown. Of all the times that Kyle O'Reilly has come back to beat up Adam Cole after a sudden but inevitable betrayal, this one felt the weakest is all I'm gonna say. But then we see Finn in the ring still. He turns around and goes, what took you so long? And Karrion Cross is standing there and they stare each other down and Karrion says TikTok. And that's setting up, clearly, that match at TakeOver. I think it's a matter of time before Karrion gets the title back, honestly. But discussing that is for another day. I think this closing segment, the match, and the thing with Kyle and Adam Cole, and then leading to this with Finn and Karrion, I think the whole closing segment was very well done. Dynamite kicks off with a rare singles match for Matt Jackson as he takes on Ray Phoenix of the Death Triangle. And this is a really fun match, really fun opener. Phoenix just flies all over the place. He is so entertaining to watch. At one point, Matt hits him with a destroyer on the outside and Phoenix has to just muster up all this energy to just jump back into the ring at the count of eight. Then from there, Matt hits a diving elbow that Tony Schiavone has the gall to describe as Randy Savage-like. Come on. In the end, Phoenix wins with a big set-out pile driver, and it was, yeah, great opening match. We see Eddie Kingston and John Moxley sharing a drink together on somebody's porch, and if anybody could explain away why they sold that non-explosion at the end of Revolution like death, it's Kingston. He goes on to explain that, you know, in the heat of the moment, in the tension, he was starting to get flashbacks to when he was in prison and the anxiety he felt there, and he blacked out. And that's why he sold that non-explosion like death. So, you know, it's it's not the best explanation in the world, but it's probably the most logical one. And yeah, who else but Kingston is going to say something like that and say it in a, in a believable way, you know, that makes you think, oh, that could feasibly happen. He and Moxley joke about how it was Impact Wrestling that paid for the explosives that night and how Moxley, you know, he didn't regain the title on that night, but he did regain a drinking buddy in Kingston. So it's water under the bridge for those two guys, and all is well with them. And Moxley issues one more threat to Omega, saying, next time you flash a weapon, you better be using it. You know what? It's uh, after the debacle of Sunday night, that's probably the best way they could have explained what happened there. It's still really unfortunate they had to do that. Cody Rhodes squashes Seth Gargas in under a minute with a figure four. Yawn. Tony Schiavone gets in the ring to interview him about how his shoulder's doing and everything, when suddenly Penta Elzetto 
Miguel Miedo stands up from the, annou the Spanish announce desk, looking very dapper, by the way. He cuts a promo, but he has Alex Abrahantes from the announce team to translate for him. Alex is very smug here. He's almost like a heel manager in this regard. I'm like, that seems very, I mean, is he a heel on the Spanish announce team? I don't know. Somebody fill me in on that, because it seemed almost kind of weird for him to be talking mad shit to Cody, like, through Penta, though, but in this way where it's like, yeah, what are you going to do about it? I'm the announcer. So anyway, Penta is saying that he is a better wrestler than Cody. If Cody is the prince of wrestling, then he is a lord of Lucha Libre. Then gets personal and takes a swipe saying, you know, it's like, I want I, I want to break your arm or hurt your arm so bad, you can't pick up your newborn daughter. And that causes Cody to snap. And we have a bit of a pull apart brawl there. Alex is just evaporated. He wasn't part of that exchange at all when it gets physical. So we have a, we're going to find out next week of a match between the two of them. We see Chuck Taylor and Orange Cassidy in an arcade somewhere, and they challenge Kip Sabian and Miro to one more match. And Chuck sweetens the pot by saying that if he and Orange lose again, that he will become Miro's butler forever. And then they seem to allude that the, the match is going to be, the ring will be surrounded by, I'm guessing, arcade consoles that can all kind of like throw each other into. We'll see how that goes. And then we see yet another Sting interview on the stage. Oh, Sting and Tony Schiavone, best friends together again on that stage for an interview. Sting putting over Darby Allen and their victory in the Street Fighter Revolution. And suddenly Lance Archer and Jake Roberts emerge. And Archer, back to his heel roots, it seems here. He's cutting quite the heelish promo, saying he does not need to have won the ladder match to prove he's the face of the revolution. Has some strong words towards Sting, and then he and Jake leave, and Sting says, okay, Tony, see ya. And that was that. Boy, I'm sure I'm glad to keep doing that interview segment with Sting. QT Marshall's backstage with Lee Johnson. He's asked about what happened in the tag team battle royal when he left Dustin Rhodes high and dry. He says he's only human and he made a mistake, which I'm sure, by the way, will never be compounded on again. Up next, we see uh, Lee Johnson taking on the debuting Ethan Page. We saw him make his official debut at Revolution in the ladder match. This is his first Dynamite match. And as soon as Ethan's intro begins, we get a real big audio issue. Somewhere at Turner Tower, uh, the wires got crossed and we're hearing some basketball audio. Like we're here, like defense chants and everything. At, at, at least it makes the crowd sound more raucous than it really is. Uh, but yeah, this thing, it goes the entire length of the match through commercial break, back from the break, and we're still having these audio issues. It's a good match, at least. Page wins the Outsider's Edge or the Razor's Edge, puts the boots to Johnson, and then Dustin Rhodes makes a save while QT just walks away and leaves, leaving the Nightmare family high and dry again. But then again, maybe he was leaving to just turn off that extra basketball audio, and it worked because as soon as he left the shot, the audio went back to normal, so good for you, QT. We see Hangman Page on a big lawnmower, clearly using the money he won from Matt Hardy responsibly. And he invites all the Dark Order except for number five because there's a weight limit onto the lawnmower, and he drives them off all to get ice cream, and Colt Cabana falls off the lawnmower as it's driving off. It was a pretty entertaining bit there. And then it's time for poor Tony Schiavone to be interrupted once again. He's on the stage. He's supposed to be interviewing Christian Cage, but out comes the AEW champion Kenny Omega with Don Callis, and the Good Brothers. We get some more kind of like backfield explanation as to why the explosion was so bad on Sunday, where Callis says, you know, we can't confirm or deny we're responsible for that, but it's a win-win situation because had the explosion worked, Moxie would have been vaporized and gone, and we wouldn't have to deal with them anymore. But because the explosion didn't work out, everyone, you know, Moxie and Kingston look like idiots. Omega talks about not only did he beat Moxie, but he embarrassed him as well and said Kingston was dry humping him to protect him. Kingston actually shows up there Don Callis gets involved and says, you know, every time you get this close to success, you end up screwing it up for yourself. He gives him 10 seconds to leave, and then he says to remind him, here's a countdown timer, and they have to play the same sound effects from Revolution, and uh, Callis and Omega are playing it up big. And then Omega goes, 69 me, Don, 69 me, save me. And they, they fucking do it. They literally do that in the middle of the ring. I could not believe that. Like, wow, we're just getting full-on gay jokes now from Kenny Omega. Who would have thought? So Kenny then eggs on Kingston to hit him. He does. And then we get a brawl. John Moxie runs in and everyone there is being chased out. We're just out of Kenny in the ring. Uh, Christian Cage's music plays and Christian shows up. He didn't get to talk like he was like we they, they were advertising he would. But show up he did. He gets in the ring, stares down Omega. Omega goes for a shot, but uh, Christian stops him. He, he chases Omega out of the 
ring, or he's going for the unpretty or the kill switch, and then Callus pulls Omega out to save him. Christian holding the championship, and uh, that's how we end the segment there. And boy, are they really going to hot shot a title match with Christian and Omega? Or are they just, at the very least, given the benefit of the doubt, they're just maybe planting the seeds for one? I really hope it's the latter of those two because, you know, as happy as I am to see Christian get a shot in AEW, I think it's a bit too early to put him in that title picture because the idea of him leapfrogging and jumping to the front of the line to get a title shot with Omega, it does feel like a pattern we've seen before that's not too great to follow. Six women tag match up next as Dr. Britt Baker, Nyla Rose, and Maki Ito take on Thunder Rosa, Ryo Mizunami, and Hikaru Shida. Uh, the best part of this match is the beginning when Maki is doing her pop idol. She's doing a big song and dance on the stage. Everyone else gets in the ring and start fighting each other. The brawl is happening. She just keeps on singing. She's got to let her voice be heard. I love Maki so much. She's great here in this matchup. Really cool like twisting dive on the outside by Thunder onto everybody near the end. Ultimately, Rebel slash Reba gets on the apron to try and distract, but it backfires. Thunder just spikes Maki in the ring to win the match. It looked really brutal. But then afterward, Britt jumps Thunder, puts her in the locked jaw, and uh, just put more heat on that rivalry. And we find out that next week they're going to have a lights out match next week as the main event, which I'm excited about because uh, I think it's been a really good rivalry so far between them. And I'm pretty sure this is the first women's main event in Dynamite history. Yes? Am I wrong? Somebody let me know if I'm wrong because I'm probably wrong. I'm sure y'all will let me know. In the bar, we see Matt Hardy and Private Party. Matt does not seem too devastated stated about, you know, losing his first quarter earnings to Hangman Page on Sunday, says, you know, he may have stole, stolen a safe from me on Sunday, but I've been filling up safes for my entire career. He says he's going to sign some new members to the Matt Hardy Empire. It's the Butcher, the Blade, and the Bunny, and he says the next course of action is for them to destroy the Dark Order for what they did to him. And now it's time for the TNT Championship match as uh, Darby Allen defends against Scorpio Sky, who won the big golden donut at uh, the latter match at Revolution, so he's got this match here, and it's a great match. Match, by the way. It's just really, it's a great back and forth between these two. Uh, it's just straight up wrestling, and I think they tell a really good story. In the end, uh, Darby counters the TKO into a surprise roll-up, there's that move again, for Darby to win and retain. But then afterwards, Scorpio turns the dark side. He really just puts a hurtin' on Darby, gets him in a heel hook for the longest time, and the referee's trying to pull him apart. What, no sting to save him? So Scorpio, he looks at his hands afterward, he seems to like what he sees, and a little bit extra detail, he leaves through the heel tunnel. That's how you know it's happening. So good to see Scorpio get a bit of an edge here. Like, I wonder how that's going to affect the relationship with SCU, who, by the way, we did see earlier in the show watching the Matt Jackson Phoenix match from afar. So how is that dynamic going to be shifted? Uh, you know, is, will we get an acknowledgement of that? Uh, Scorpio Sky turning heel. I'm curious to see where that goes. Uh, but as we see tonight, things are getting kind of heel heavy right now. It's time now for the Inner Circle War Council. Uh, Chris Jericho opens things up saying maybe it's time to add a new member to the Inner Circle to improve things. But MJF says maybe it's time to actually remove a member. Suddenly, Sammy Guevara shows back up and he implores Chris to watch this footage. He planted a camera in the Inner Circle locker room and we see MJF openly conspiring with Santana, Ortiz, and Jake Hager to, you know, uh, overthrow Chris Jericho and take over the Inner Circle. They also seem to be in on it. And so we get this face off here where MJF wants to sick the guys onto Jericho and Guevara, but suddenly it's a, it's a, it's another swerve because they are all in on it and they are aware of the conspiracy. And now all the original inner circle guys are going to team up against MJF and beat him down. But MJF is begging off saying, I never meant to, you know, take over the inner circle because I was busy building one of my own. The lights cut out, they come back up and suddenly we see in the ring, FTR, Tully Blanchard, Wardlow, and Sean Spears and they all beat the bejesus out of the inner circle while MJF sits on his perch in the corner and watches everything unfold. Santana and Ortiz are handcuffed. Jake Hager is hitting the head with a bottle. And ultimately, MJF decks Jericho with a diamond ring and the baseball bat leaving him bloody. And Wardlow power bombs Jericho off the stage through some tables to close out this segment. And I thought this was a great way to close out the show and a really cool just like twist in this whole sort of tale. I mean, we knew that MJF was going to turn on Jericho but the, the specifics of which I don't think anybody could have expected. I think this is a really cool, like, uh, surprise move. You know, MJF said months ago he wanted to join a wolf pack. Who knew that meant he was actually forming his own wolf pack to counteract the inner circle? I think this was great.
great. And putting MJF in a leadership position, I think is going to be really cool. And this whole super group is really, has a lot of great potential there. My one nitpick though, at the end of this segment was like, damn, there are a lot of heel super groups right now, heel stables. Cause you've already got, you know, uh, Kenny Omega and the good brothers and Don Callis. We just saw Matt Hardy empire growing a lot tonight. And now we've got this super group with MJF. Like, you no, know, they can't all occupy the same space. Like Omega and the good brothers, they're going to be on top for a while. I feel like, so what are MJF and his group going to do? What are Matt Hardy empire going to do? I feel of the three heel super groups, that one's going to be left by the wayside the most, I think. But yeah, this just seems very heel heavy right now. With Scorpio Sky turning heel, this already, and they already were heels, but now they're just a group of heels in a company that has a lot of groups of heels. So that's my one real nitpick about it is where they're going to all kind of you know, where it's all going to shake out in the end. But in the moment, at least, really cool twists and turns, a lot of layers put in this final segment. So I was definitely a fan. Time now for me to decide which show won for the week, NXT or AEW Dynamite. And I could not pick a winner. I was so torn. I got to give it a tie this week. I really enjoyed both shows. I think AEW or NXT, I should say, had some great championship matches. And I think the introduction of and the changing hands of the tag team titles in one night was a bold move, but I think it was an entertaining move for them to do that. Also, I like where they're kind of building with the Cruiserweight Championship situation and the program with Balor and Cross coming up. With AEW, I also enjoyed the majority of the matches we saw on this show. I really enjoyed the depth we were getting with a lot of different stories and characters. You know, like I said, the Scorpio Sky heel turn was pretty interesting. The twist of MJF starting his own group was really cool. Maki Ito is great. Put her on TV every segment for all I care. I think that was she was wonderful to see. There's a lot of cool stuff going on with AEW as well. And yes, even the way they had to try and haphazardly explain the shitty explosion at the end of the main event on Sunday, I think was done about as well as they possibly could do it. Again, in a perfect world, I wish they didn't have to do it. But they did, and then they pulled it off, in, 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 again, as good a fashion as they possibly could have. So yeah, I was definitely entertained by both shows and ultimately that's kind of my end game is to enjoy what I watch. But what did you think of AEW and NXT this week? Let me know in the comment section below. I'm Brian Zane and I'll see you next time.